Hello, and uh, welcome to the first CJS colloquium this spring. I am Junko Habu, the chair of the Center for Japanese Studies and professor of anthropology. And uh, I am the host of today's event. Our speaker today is uh, Ms. Hanayo Oya, a journalist and a documentary filmmaker. Hanayo was a visiting scholar at CJS from November 2019 to October 2021 to analyze how the status of forces agreement of the US military has affected the criminal jurisdiction of host countries in East Asia and Europe. Hanayo is committed to using journalism and films to protect the rights of marginalized people in contemporary society. She's known for her work on issues of Okinawa, especially regarding influences of the US military presence on local community. Hanayo believes that journalists are responsible for empowering people to question the status quo through reporting the facts, which can be used as a mirror to examine society. Her latest documentary film, Boy Soldiers, has been shown at theaters in Japan, as well as at international festivals. Her talk today is titled, Investigating the US Military Crimes in Japan. She will give her talk for about 40 minutes, and you can submit questions at any point during the talk using the Q&A function. Please welcome Hanayo Oya. Hello, everybody. Thank you so much for the introduction, Professor Junko Sensei. Um, I'm going to share my screen. And just give me a moment, please. Okay, so um, thank you very much for joining my lecture today. Uh, my name is Hanaya Oya. I'm a journalist and documentary filmmaker originally from Japan. So it's been three years since I moved to the US. I, I initially moved to California in 2018 when I got opportunity to study at the investigative reporting program at UC Berkeley under the Fulbright, Fulbright Scholarship Program. Then I decided to extend my stay under the Center for the Japanese Studies, where I researched about the topic of criminal jurisdiction of US military. So today I will talk about the outcome of my re research for the last two years at CJS. Well, 10 years ago, I started my professional career as a TV reporter at the local TV station in Okinawa. Okinawa carries the heaviest burden of the US military bases in Japan. Thus, as a TV reporter in Okinawa, it was natural for me to start working on the issues related to the US military bases in Okinawa, especially of the crimes and accidents related to US military service members. Based on this experience, the core value of my reporting has become advocating for accountability of military policy and helping people make informed decisions. Most recently, I published a nonfiction book and a documentary film about the Battle of Okinawa in 1945 and how recent US-Japan military policy affects people in Okinawa. Okinawa is the southernmost prefecture of Japan, which consists of 48 inhabited islands at the border of China, the Philippines, and Taiwan. The population is 1.4 million, which accounts for about 1% of Japan's population. The main island of Okinawa, which you can see in the center of this map, is where the US military bases are heavily concentrated. On the main island of Okinawa, where more than 90% of the population lives, the US military bases occupy about 15% of the landmass. At present, Okinawa Prefecture hosts 31 US military facilities in total. And in addition to facilities on land, surrounding waters and airspace are under the control of US military as a training areas and there are restrictions on fishing and air routes. 
So about 70% of the area of U.S. military facilities nationwide is concentrated in Okinawa Prefecture. And if you consider the fact that Okinawa Prefecture is just only about 0.6% of the national land area, it's obvious that Okinawa has a heavy burden of hosting these military facilities. But how come the U.S. military operates in foreign countries, which has different rules and regulations? So this is where today's topics comes in play, the status of forces agreements, which in short, so far, so far as a multilateral or bilateral agreement between the U.S. and the host country that refers to legal arrangements regarding facilities, U.S. service members, their families and children, civilian employees, as well as contractors with some condition. The United States currently has more than 800 U.S. military bases all over the world and has 100, uh, over 100 SOFAR agreements. The U.S. Japan SOFAR is one of them. So how exactly does SOFAR matter to communities that host to U.S. military bases. Under U.S. Japan so far, the U.S. is granted exemption and immunity, such as accountability for environmental damage done on or by U.S. military bases in Japan, and compensation to local people suffering from extreme noise. Most recently, the Omicron outbreak in Japan is greatly related to so far. U.S. military personnel do not need a visa or a passport to enter Japan. They only need a valid U.S. military ID card. They are not subject to the quarantine policy of the government of Japan. So what happened? On January 11th, the U.S. forces Japan reported nearly 4,000 active cases across major bases in Japan. The outcome has filled out from the basis to local communities, and now the local people are experiencing a serious outbreak. So far also allows the U.S. military exclusive rights to access and maintain these bases. Therefore, even if U.S. service members assault women or cause bodily injury to local people by driving under the influence, if they flee to the U.S. military bases, the local police cannot do anything immediately. In many past cases, the offenders escaped from Japan or went back to the US. This situation has been called a hit and run situation. And because of so far, the US military also has the power to take control of investigation of accidents. I took this photo while I was reporting from the accident site of U.S. military aircraft, Osprey, the U.S. military conducted investigations and it took every single part of the aircraft from the venue, while local authorities were not allowed to enter the area for investigations. Among all legal immunities, the most powerful right the U.S. has been granted is a criminal jurisdiction, which is a core topic of this lecture. If your service members, their families, employees, and the contractors commit crimes or cause accidents while on official duty, which is called armed duty, the U.S. is granted primary right to jurisdiction over the cases. Therefore, even if Japanese nationals suffer damage in such cases, Japan doesn't have right to exercise jurisdiction. On the other hand, for the cases that happen outside of official duty, which is called off-duty, Japan is granted the exercise of jurisdiction. The U.S. has the right to determine whether the case were on duty or off-duty. Since the end of American occupation of Japan in 1952, there have been over 200,000 crimes and accidents related to the U.S. military in Japan and over 1,000 Japanese civilians have been killed in such crimes and accidents. The death toll from these was 521 during the armed duty in which the U.S. had a primary jurisdiction, and 571 
during off-duty, in which Japan had a primary jurisdiction. These cases do not contain the numbers that happened in Okinawa before its reversion in 1972. So let's see the situation in Okinawa. Since Okinawa reverted to Japan in 1972, there have been over 6,000 criminal cases. Of these, 581 were violent crimes such as murder, robbery, rape, and arson. These numbers are the cases that Okinawa Prefectural Police acknowledged, which means that there are many more unreported cases. However, the crucial problem is not merely the number of crimes and accidents, but it is the way these crimes are treated. So if you look at the prosecution rate of the US military offenses in the Japanese justice system, you might be surprised by the low prosecution rate, which is about 20%. This slide shows the data I obtained through a freedom of information request to the Ministry of Justice Japan. From 2008 to 2019, the number of criminal offenses involving US military personnel handled by the prosecutors nationwide was 5,177. Of these, 4,107 were not prosecuted. So Japan dropped to almost 80% of the cases. So these cases went under the jurisdiction of the US. But why did Japan do that? You might wonder that these cases happened during the official duty, so Japan didn't have a primary jurisdiction. In fact, out of the total dropped cases, 847 were dropped because of official duty reasons. This means that Japan dropped 3,260 cases without exercising its right to try the cases. So why did Japan drop such a large number of cases? To answer this question, we need to understand the secret agreement that Japan and the US made nearly 70 years ago. In 2011, Ministry of Foreign Affairs Japan released this historical document with the title, Subcommittee on Jurisdiction, Administrative Agreement Matters Criminal Panel. The administrative agreement is the previous version of current Japan-US offer. This document is a record of the meeting where the representatives of Japan and the US discussed what to do with the jurisdiction of the US forces in Japan. So let's see the document. According to this document, Minoru Tsuda, a Japanese representative, said this at the criminal committee. I can state that as a matter of policy, the Japanese authorities do not normally intend to exercise the primary right to jurisdiction over the members of the United States Armed Forces, the civilian component, or their dependents subject to the military law of the United States, other than in the cases considered to be of material importance to Japan. So Japan waived, waived jurisdiction over US military personnel. It's obviously granted extraterritoriality. Although the existence of this secret agreement has been widely known in Japan, it has often been unclear as of the reason why Japan signed such an agreement. So I decided to research on this topic. During the lockdown and the pandemic, I had plenty of time researching the archives of the US Department and National Archives. And through my investigation, I wanted to understand the reason why Japan decided to make such an agreement to abandon its jurisdiction. Obviously, the agreement regulates sovereignty and normally no country wanted to sign such an agreement, except if they are granted benefits in exchange. So I wanted to understand what kind of deal was behind this secret. 
to answer this question, I had to go back to 1951, even before the secret agreement, agreement was made. It was just six years after the end of World War II, and Japan was still under Allied occupation as a defeated country. In that year, Japan signed two historical treaties. The first one was the San Francisco Peace Treaty, which promised the withdrawal of the Allied forces and Japan's independence. The second one was the U.S.-Japan Security Treaty, which allowed the U.S. troops to remain in Japan as a U.S. force in Japan upon Japan's independence. The enforcement date of these treaties was set for seven months after the assigning. Until that time, Japan and the U.S. needed to develop the administrative agreement, which was a rule book that stipulated how to operate the U.S. forces Japan. However, both Japan and the U.S. were struggling over jurisdiction, the core of the agreement. For the Japanese negotiators, restoring jurisdiction over the military crimes was a long cherished dream. Because in occupied Japan, the U.S. had jurisdiction over all crimes committed by U.S. military personnel, regardless of whether the cases happened on duty or off duty. Even if Japan became independent, it could not be called a sovereign nation if it didn't have jurisdiction. However, the U.S. insisted that it should keep its exclusive jurisdiction even after Japan's independence. Kumao Nishimura was one of the Japanese negotiators at the front line of the U.S.-Japan negotiations. He suggested that the U.S. jurisdiction should be limited over on-duty crimes and a violation of the military laws. He made a draft based on the NATO so far. Nishimura believed that if European countries were allowed to have jurisdiction, Japan should also be allowed jurisdiction. However, the U.S. Congress had not ratified the NATO SOFR yet. For this reason, the U.S. put a condition that the Japan would be given the same level of jurisdiction as European countries only when the NATO SOFR comes into effect in the U.S. Until that time, the U.S. would continue to have exclusive jurisdiction in Japan. In April that year, this agreement was enforced along with Japan's independence and the deployment of U.S. forces in Japan. In reality, the privilege of the U.S. military remained the same as during the occupation. As an exchange of Japan's independence, Okinawa, Amami, and the Ogasawala Islands were separated from Japan, and Okinawa remained under U.S. military control for the next 20 years. Nishimura's record is filled with regret. Japan only gave but didn't take. We were unable to achieve the goals and were very dissatisfied and secretly hoped that we would be able to improve the situation as soon as possible. So what I could see from Nishimura's statement was a strong passion for recovering of sovereignty. This made me even more difficult to understand the reason why Japan made the secret agreement to abandon its jurisdiction. So let's continue to find an answer. A year after the agreement came into effect, an opportunity for renegotiation occurred. The U.S. Senate ratified the NATO so far. Now Japan could start negotiations with the U.S. to revise the agreement, seeking a NATO-like agreement as promised. Japan waited, but didn't hear anything from the U.S. So what was happening behind the scene? While I was searching for clues, I found out various telegrams had been exchanged among the Pentagon, the State Department, and the U.S. Embassy in Japan regarding the granting of jurisdiction to Japan. One was this telegram. It was issued by John Henderson, the Pentagon's legal advisor. 
the recipient was John Allison, the U.S. ambassador to Japan. In this telegram, Henderson says, the critical item in the negotiation is a question of Japanese willingness to waive all cases in which they have primary jurisdiction, except these cases considered to be of particular importance to Japan, as well as agreement by the Japanese that under this phrase, the number of cases they try will be very small. So Henderson wrote that Japan would be granted jurisdiction, but at the same time, they wanted Japan to waive the jurisdiction by making these agreements. I found another telegram that also suggesting waiver agreements. The sender was O.P. Weyrand, the general of U.S. Far Eastern Air Forces. The addressee was also the U.S. ambassador to Japan, Allison. In this telegram, Wayland expressed his strong concern about giving Japan jurisdiction and suggested to make arrangement to limit Japanese jurisdiction in all but extraordinary cases of particular importance to Japan. The document is dated August 12th, the same day as the telegram from Henderson. So interestingly, two top Pentagon officials we're sending the letter to the same person on the same day. Both of them were insisting to nullify Japanese jurisdiction. However, if Japan's jurisdiction is to be nullified, why did the US recognize Japan's jurisdiction in the first place? The Wayland Telegram provides the answer to this question as follows. It is considered that the subject of extraterritoriality has become charged with a considerable degree of political sensitivity in Japan. However, it is hoped that the Japanese government's realization of its right to exercise primary jurisdiction can be utilized to satisfy its internal political requirements. In Japan back then, there was a strong criticism against the US military presence. When the US-Japan Security Treaty was enforced, students, communists, and local uh, labor unions conducted a huge protest in Tokyo, which escalated to a bloody conflict between protesters and the police. Calls for, calls for revisions of criminal jurisdiction were growing day by day. So this is why Whalen seems to think that by daring to give Japan jurisdiction, he could help the Japanese government suppress anti-American sentiment. And this seems to later become an attractive reason for Japan to sign such an agreement. Of course, the jurisdiction granted, granted was just ostensible for the US all it would take is for Japan to waive the right of prosecution in the end. Now, door to a secret agreement is slowly opening. In August, Japanese negotiators finally received the first draft from the US side. The draft indeed stated that Japan would be granted jurisdiction for off-duty cases. The Japanese must have been delighted to see the, the draft because it was their long cherished dream to get a NATO level agreement. However, there was another document attached to the draft, which was draft of official minutes. It said that the Japanese government does not desire to exercise its primary jurisdiction, except in cases considered to be of particular importance to Japan. So like the Pentagon officials suggested with the telegrams earlier, the US suggested Japan to nullify, so US suggested to make agreement to nullify Japanese jurisdiction. So what did Japan do? Let's see a report written by Kijiro Miyake 
a counselor of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, Japan. This record is a key to understand why Japan began to compromise its jurisdiction over military crimes. According to the record, soon after the Japanese negotiators received the US draft, Miyake had lunch twice along with Jules Bassing, a legal advisor at the US Embassy in Japan. So interestingly, Miyake stated the conversa started the conversation confessing his strong concern about anti-American movement. Miyake said, there is a considerable anti-American sentiment among the Japanese people. The intelligentsia and the journalists will speculate that the US must be making some unreasonable demands that differ from the NATO approach. And that will definitely have an unfavorable impact on the US-Japan relationship. I'm really worried about that. His record also has a trace that he wrote, if the negotiations were prolonged or break down, there is a fear that anti-American sentiment of our people may become violent. Then he erased the sentence roughly. Miyake's biggest concern seems to be an escalation of the anti-American movement in Japan. And having heard Miyake's concern, Bashini asked him, how about the Japanese government's policy being stated by the Japanese delegate at the official meeting? And it recorded in the record of the meeting with the two delegates initialing at the end. Miyake answered, my personal opinion is that if the record is to be treated as confidential, there is room for the Japanese side to consider it. So normally the content of the official meetings are recorded in official minutes. And contrary to this custom, if the statement and the records are related to waiver agreement were to be treated confidential, Miyake accepted Bashin's offer to consider the statement format proposed by the US. And at this point, Bashin may have been discovered the weakness of Japanese side from the way that Miyake implied confidential. So to get Japan to accept the US proposal, it was not the matter of compromising the content of the agreement, but simply changing the forms. At the second lunch meeting, Bassin asked, Washington is insisting that the substance of the US proposal be preserved while the form is not so important. What was on Miyake's mind? Miyake wrote this in his record. The ice was broken when it became clear that the US had made concessions regarding forms. Now the negotiations was about to cross a significant point. The US said that it didn't care how the records were kept. If Japan agreed to waive its jurisdiction, Japan said it was willing to accept the US request if the records were kept confidential. The secret agreement was finally about to take shape. A few days later, informal talks between the US and Japan started in Tokyo. Koto Matsudaira, one of the Japanese representatives, left a daily report. According to this report, it was actually Japan that desired to keep the negotiations secret. Japan suppressed the US military's demand for an official meeting and avoided the presence of United Nations military representatives to make progress in the negotiations confidentially. In 10 days, they finalized the wording of the waiver of jurisdiction. On that day, the US ambassador to Japan, Allison, sent a telegram to the US Department of State, which contained a surprising piece of information. The US and Japan not only agreed on waiver of jurisdiction, 
but they also decided the policy on how the secret agreement would be implemented. According to the telegram, the Japanese representative stated that any decisions by local prosecutors that cases of material importance will be referred to Justice Ministry in Tokyo for decisions whether to take jurisdiction. At this point, a bizarre system regarding US military crimes have begun to spread within Japanese justice system. It was a top-down structure of waiver of judicial authority headed by the Ministry of Justice. No Japanese reporter knew that such an agreement existed. The newspapers reported the signing ceremony extensively and congratulated the acquisition of jurisdiction. The Japanese media failed completely in informing the public about the truth behind the curtain. A month later, Minoru Tsuda from the Minister of Justice, Japan, stated the promised deal in the Japan-US Joint Committee. Thus, Japanese primary jurisdiction was abandoned behind the closed doors. And today, the agreement is still active and influences local communities at the gates of, local, at the gates of military bases. This data was the one I introduced at the beginning of this lecture. Out of the total dropped cases, Japan dropped 3,260 cases without exercising its jurisdiction. In other words, these cases were not considered to be of material importance to Japan. I also sent an inquiry to the person responsible to this issue, Judge Advocate General, US Forces Command in Japan. He responded by email that in 100% of the cases involving Japan's primary jurisdiction, the U.S. has requested Japan to allow the U.S. to exercise the U.S. jurisdiction. He also mentioned that securing jurisdiction is a global policy of the United States. So what is this policy? Let's look at the document available on the U.S. State Department. And this document explains the reason why software is so essential for the U.S. The report explains that a key function of software is protecting U.S. military personnel from being subjected to unfair justice systems. This is important not only to protect the rights of U.S. service members overseas, but also to protect the U.S. willingness to deploy forces overseas and the public support for such deployment. Otherwise, they could suffer significant setbacks if U.S. personnel were at risk of being tried in inherently unfair system. Therefore, SOFR is a lifeline of global strategy of the United States. U.S. military deployment and the extraterritoriality is an inseparable issue. This can be applied to all countries that host U.S. military. Through my investigation, I attempted to understand the reason why Japan decided to make the agreement to abandon its jurisdiction. And here's my answer. The Japanese authorities wanted to suppress anti-American movement within Japan in early 1950s, especially when Japan was having nationwide criticism against the US military presence and their exclusive jurisdiction. To ease the anger and the frustration of its people, Japanese authorities wanted to secure criminal jurisdiction, even though such jurisdiction is superficial. Therefore, Japan accepted the US request to waive its criminal jurisdiction. Remember, it was Japan to, keep, to, to request the US to keep the agreement secret. The U.S.-Japan so far has not been revised since then and still carries many issues 
from the occupation period. At the end of this lecture, I would like to propose three assignments to the people of Japan, the US, and all country that hosts US military. First, I think we should think this issue as prospective of fairness. Securing so far functions as a message to US military personnel and American people that the US military will always protect the right. However, from the local people's point of view, this is not acceptable. The local people must think everyone must be tried under the same laws in this country. So I argue that the cancellation of the secret agreement and legal re reformation and a revision of so far, and it must be done to increase fairness. Secondly, we should increase transparency of military justice system. And a reporter like myself, investigating military issues, especially criminal justice issue, is very, very difficult topic because the military is almost like a black box. So once the jurisdiction is handed over to the US side, there's no more legal source or Ex effectively no transparency for reporters and the local communities and the local people are left behind. So I request the US military to publish the record of the, their judgments in public. Lastly, we needed to take accountability for their own military policy. I argue that most American people don't know about this issue and also, they're not, they're not aware of the extraterritorial issues in host countries. And also, I believe that many more American, American reporters needed to start working on this issue, go to the, the communities living with the US military, and then listen to the people and start writing more about this story. This will help the public to make informed decisions. To compel fundamental reform to so far, citizens and reporters must work together on this issue. Thank you very much for joining my lecture. So on the right side, I listed the refinances. So if you would like to learn more about this topic, I recommend you to read these books. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Hanayo-san. Uh, let's see, I there's a long uh, comment. I'm trying to figure out if this is a question or a comment. I'll read it first. Sure. Most observers would agree that the SOFA results in usual um, imposition of US military jurisdiction in Japan. However, most non-Japanese are also quite critical of Japanese criminal law and uh, procedure. For example, former US ambassador to Japan, um, Haggerty, now a senator, recently described the Japanese treatment of the accused as unfair, outdated, and the barbaric. Given this perception of the Japanese legal system being so skewed in favor of prosecutors, how can you expect the US to revise the SOFA to satisfy Japan's request? It may be that the notion of fairness in the treatment of the accused in the US and Japan are too far apart to expect easy resolution. Thank you very much for your comment. I mean, actually, this is what I really wanted to tell my audience, my readers, because this sulfur issue is inseparable with the issue of Japanese criminal justice system. As um, Mr. Glenn, uh, is, it, is Mr. or is, I'm sorry if you're the one missed it, Mr. Uh, Fukushima uh, um, mentioned that the Japanese justice system has a lot of problems 
And then from the American perspective, I totally understand that requesting, requesting the US to adapting the Japanese justice system is really uh, problematic from the American perspective. So when Japan wanted to, wanted to revise so far, we at the same time, we need to work on improve, improving our justice system in Japan as well. And I assume that this is another reason why Japan is so reluctant to requesting the US to revise so far. So like I said, for the last 70 years, so far has not been revised. And the Japan didn't even ask the US to revise it. And then why is that? So the, the comment you just gave me was actually a really convincing reason for me because Japanese justice system is really prob problematic. So in order to um, make the situation better with so far, I think the, the Japanese uh, scholars, journalists, and the legal, uh, legal specialist has to work together, both on um, uh, improving so far at the same time Japanese laws. Thank you. Next question um, is from uh, Natsumi Ohara, and um, thank you so much. Could you talk about how the murder case by U.S. civilian in 2016 in Okinawa resulted in the revision in the supplementary agreement of SOFA? Murder case by U.S. civilian. U.S. civilian. Uh, murder case U.S. civilian. So I I assume that Natsumi-san is talking about the the murder case of 20 years old woman in Okinawa, is that, am I right? In Uruma city, is that what you mentioned? Yes, thank you so much. So what happened was in April, 2000, 2016, 20 years old woman was assaulted sexually, I mean, raped and murdered and abandoned in the mountain of Okinawa. And the, the assault was the former Marine who was back then working as civilian contractor on the base. And that time, actually I was one of the reporter who was reporting this issue in the front line. And that was really heartbreaking for me. And this is actually the main reason why I'm still working on this issue. And what happened was back then the Japanese government and the local people realized that the sofa contains a serious issue about the definition of contractors. So in, in a Japan, in Japan US sofa, it says a uh, civilian component and the contractor, definition of a contractor was really, really vague. But the, the, the perpetrator was employed by no, and he wasn't employed directly by US military, but he was employed by a company which had a contract with US military inside the US space. So eventually uh, he was decided to the, so he, he, he wasn't, he wasn't, uh, he, uh, how to say, it? so he wasn't considered as the part of so far, finally at, at, the, at the end, but there was a long discussion to decide whether the case goes applied so far or not. Then back then, I really, um, it was really surprising for me that until this, you know, horrible crime happened, we really didn't know much about what kind of legal issue that SOFA has and how that affects local people in this way. Thank you. Next question is from uh, Ronald um, Pereira. What kinds of crimes do US do in Japan? And uh, um, I think um, Japan wanted to be um, free is why they agreed. Um, 
Um, could you could you repeat the question, please? So, um, what kind I think of uh, he's asking uh, what kind of crimes do U.S. do in Japan, and uh, why um, did Japan agree to such a um, agreement? Um, so the how do you say it? so <laughs> that the actually the why we uh, the reason why we agreed on this document was what I actually discussed in this picture. So uh, once again, the reason Japan agreed on this agreement was that in 1950s, there was American anti-American movement and the US, uh, Japan wanted to suppress it uh, to keep the friendly relationship with the US. And in order to secure link the criminal jurisdiction, even though it's superficially, it helped the Japan to look independent. So um, that was the main reason that I found through my investigation. And the, considering the matter about the, uh, the, the criminal cases that are happening in the communities at the gates of US military bases are, uh, so there are, you know, many cases, so martyrs and rapes and arsons, robbery and drunken drive, it's a really uh, common thing. Um, so when I was in, when I was reporting, when I was working as a reporter in Okinawa, um, I was really surprised to see that how frequently these crimes are happen. And it was actually a part of my daily life to, to report these crimes. And every time my phone calls uh, from, the, from the police or from the company, my boss, I was wishing that, oh, please, it's, I, please, it's, please don't give me military crimes because in that case, the situation will be really, really complicated. And that will, that will in that case, the the victims have to suffer the more than more than what they do in the ordinary cases. So I really really wish that every time. And um, so I want to I want to give you one example. So one time um, I remember the case that there was a drunken drive and hit and run. So there was a two U.S. service members in. Um, in outside of Naha, in the, the capital of Okinawa. And then 70 years old man, a local man was injured in the car accident. But the perpetrators, they were, it was the two American service members that they run from the venue and they went inside the military base. So what happened was local police couldn't do anything immediately, even though it happened off duty. Because like I said in this today lecture, the local police or authorities do not have access to the military bases. And later on, the military police handed over the perpetrators to Japanese side. And then the military actually conducted um, uh, alcohol test and that uh, that was believed to become um, strong proof to, to strong evidence to show that it was accident drunk DUI, drunk under the inference. Um, however, uh, that evidence was not, could not be used in the trial because uh, the US military was using a different device of alcohol um, inspector than the one that the Japanese police were using. So uh, this kind of issue is happening because of the sofa. Thank you. We have uh, a lot more questions. The next okay. one is from Oyu Furusawa. How does it compare to South Korea, the Philippines and the other Asian countries? Uh, so, South Korea has been amended so far many times and at least two times, I think. And then there were, 
their criminal justice system is much better than Japan. And then the Philippines had, uh, so back then in 1950s, even Philippines had jurisdiction over the US military. So this is a great difference between the defeated country in the World War II and others. Then usually uh, many scholars and journalists compare the situation Japan with European countries. I mean, the NATO so far and Japanese, Japan, US so far, because these two are fundamentally different. So for example, um, in, in Italy, uh, the US uh, local police have a right to access to military bases. And then if military, if US military wanted to conduct a training, they needed to get a permission from the Italian government. So this is a huge difference from Japan. But however, uh, regarding the criminal jurisdiction, and it's basically, um, basically the same. For example, in, in, in Germany, uh, they do a collaborative investigation whenever accidents or crimes happen. But eventually, um, many cases, in most of the cases, the cases goes to American side. So in Japan, we don't even do collaborative investigation, but automatically, uh, if it was on duty cases, it goes to American side. So it's uh, the content itself is differs within the country, but the result is almost the same. There's always extraterritorial issues and the criminal jurisdiction in many cases goes to American side. So um, let me just to make sure what you're saying is that um, in the case of Japan, the um, confidential agreement made things um, uh, not to be seen by the Japanese public. But uh, regardless of that, um, in fact, the so far um, current practice of so far is creating similar problems in uh, different parts of the world. Is that basically what you're saying? So we are dealing with two different issues, but related. It does, it does. But in, J in Japan's case, it was not public, mm -hmm. but the other, other countries have, how to say, so yes, so, so in Japan, it was secret agreement. It had not been known, had not been informed to Japanese citizens until almost 10 years ago. And then in European countries, it was, there was a collaborative, collaborative uh, investigation, but eventually, in many cases, it goes to American side because there was a global American policy to securely criminal jurisdiction. Okay, um, thank you. The next question, um, it's an anonymous person. Can you say something about how the relationship between Japan and Okinawa, the colonial history of Okinawa, has to do with uh, your investigation? Yeah, so um, this is really important aspect and I, I didn't have a time to discuss this today, but so Okinawa used to be an independent nation 400 years ago, and then Japan conquered uh, the islands. Then since then, Japan has been, you know, controlling politically and culturally and overall. So, is politically we still have a very different, um, how to say the the climate. I would say, for example, in Okinawa, as many people are requesting the U.S. military to requesting U.S. and Japan to reduce the burdens of U.S. military bases because Okinawa carries seventy percent of the military bases in Japan, right? So. But however, if you go to the mainland of Japan, you barely hear about the news of military bases or you know, like what kind of crimes happen in the communities like this. Although there are, although in mainland of Japan there are military bases in 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 like Nagasaki or 
like um, like Kanagawa and even in Tokyo. So the the atmosphere is really different. But as a reporter in Okinawa, I believe that we really have to listen to the people who lives with those issues, and then by improving their lives and their situation, I think the Japan can be a real uh, democratic country and concentration is far, far away from sufficient now. Okay, so um, out of the 3260 dropped case, you talked when you talked about law prose prosecution rate um, from 2008 to 2019, um, how many of them are actually in Okinawa, roughly? Um, I need I need to go look at the the data. Um, I can I can research it and maybe I can follow up after this event, maybe because um, I need to uh, I'm just, uh, um, that's kind of related to the previous question, but um, um, okay. Um, so let's move on to the next one. Um, can you elaborate when a crime is committed by an American forces member or um, contractor and the case is not adjudicated by the Japanese government? How often is the case adjudicated by the US government military private contractor? I.e., is the crime ever punished? Do you have any statistics about this? I actually had a slide to show um, the related uh, data. Um, so this is a, so again, like the, the exact numbers I, I need to, to give you later on because I don't want to make a mistake about the exact data. But I want to tell you this. So in many cases when the, in Japan, in many cases that when the jurisdiction goes to the American side, these cases are not even tried in court of martial. The court of martial is American, uh, the military justice system within the US within the US military. And then the, the court of martial is really unique justice system because the, that law and that system was maintained and supported by the military. So uh, the, basically the military personnel is judging the military personnel, but not to someone um, that the special, that, that someone expert in the law or something like that. So in that case, that many of the cases were not even go to court martial or like just um, how to say, uh, uh, like a court on the tree. Uh, I'm sorry, this uh, how to say in a court on the tree or like a, like a Verbal? Yeah, oh. like a bubble, bubble. Verbal. Uh, uh, bubble uh, bubble uh, warning or, or um, maybe a record. Put into the record um, for right. the person, like right? A, yeah, verbal. Yeah, yeah. Thank you so much. So yeah, it's um. So that is the that's ha actually happening inside the military. But however, uh, researching this, the reporting in this issue is really difficult because I've been trying to find out what happened to the cases uh, when it's handed over to American side, and I've been requesting the data almost like two years. And uh, many times, the the so far, if uh, even the even though with the status, uh, no, the Freedom of Information Act, it doesn't help me with this. So I got many answers saying like you cannot, uh, you're not. Uh, we decided to decline your offer, or like you need to specify the cases, like which case you want to know, or like we cannot release this the data because it contains a. Uh, uh, personal information. So we are, it's, it's hard, it's really hard for a local reporter to know what actually happened to the cases after it's handed over to American side. Okay, I don't think we can go through all the questions, but let's try several more. Um, the next one, do a lot of Japanese citizens and or students know about the secret agreement today? It's on the second question on Q&A. Yeah, uh, unfortunately, not many people don't know. I mean, it's like I said, it's a, it's a different climate in 
the communities where US military bases are and the others. For example, in Okinawa, I would say most of the people know about these issues, especially at the gates of, at the communities in, in front of the US military bases. But if you, let's say, if you do an interview in the center of Tokyo or someone else and say, do you know there's secret agree agreement? I would say many of you said don't know. Okay. Thank you. The next one, are, there is one from uh, Spencer Holmes, but I think your answer, kind of your answer to this, uh, are these SOFA terms in Japan basically the same as in all these different countries, the US military inactive, and what the SOFA terms sent in Japan basically the template for other countries? I think the second part of the question. Okay. Um, are the so far terms set in Japan basically the template for other countries or not? The template? Uh, yes. Um, was the so far terms set in Japan, was that kind of the model for mm. uh, other countries? Or um, was that different from so far with other countries? Uh, I would say. I would say the, the content of the so far bellies uh, depends on the agreement, but the core is the same. Like I, like, I, like I explained in this lecture, the core of so far is securing criminal jurisdiction. So, or like securing as many immunities as much as possible to American side. So based on this fundament, the, the all the so far function as the same. Okay, thank you. Uh, uh, the next one, uh, I think I'll go for the Q&A first. Could yeah. Japan insist on the ne renegotiation of the SOFA? And if so, why hasn't the Japanese government acted given, I presume, domestic um, political pressure? If not, when does the current SOFA expire? Mm. Well, like I said, there was, an, there was a, no single revision or like a amendment have been done to you so far for the last 17 years. So um, the, the administrator agreement, the former version of so far was made in 1952 and it was devised in 1960s but it's like when I said revised, it's just updated. So the content itself is basically the same, but it's updated with a different title like SOFA. So this is why I said the content of SOFA still carries the lots of components from the occupied period. And the, the reason why Japan didn't want it to, to, to um, ask for the, the um, the rev revision is that um, this is a <laughs> bit complicated, but uh, in 1970s, actually Japan tried to revise it, um, and they actually actually the U.S. asked Japan, like, what kind of contents do you want it to revise? And then Japan made a list of their revision, and I wanted to change this, change this, change this, and then the U.S. says no. In the end, so that was that was happened back then. Then since then, the nothing have been changed, and what happened was um, the content of the the software hasn't changed, but the understandings or the practical manner of software have been changing day by day. But what does it mean, right? So what happened is we have U.S. Japan um, Joint Committee that happened twice a month in Tokyo. So in the meeting, the Japanese bureaucrats uh, who are from the government officials and the US military officials uh, came together and discussed how to operate so far. So they changed the function or they changed the understandings of so far with that meeting, which is completely confidential. And then, what we know is just after the meeting, maybe after 
months later, months later, years later, the, the Japanese government just released like one A4 size of paper saying like we discussed this, just a two sentences or three sentences. So we don't really know what is going on inside the meeting. And that actually another huge issue about it so far because everything is confidential. And what this matter is so uh, influential to the communities, but it's everything is in the black box. Thank you. That was an extremely um, useful piece of information. Mm. Um, are you still energetic enough to go? Yeah, sure, sure. Okay, so next one uh, is from uh, Theodore uh, Show. Hmm. Many countries established us so far to deploy forces to another country, not just the US. Do you know if there are any differences between the US, Japan so far and the so far that um, Japan or other countries secured with the US for sending their forces to the US or other countries? Mm, yeah, thank you. It's actually a very uh, important, important point. So I've been discussing that the US Japan so far at this lecture, but actually Japan had had its own so far to, um, to other country. So Djibouti is the only one country that Japan has its own base in foreign country. So Djibouti Japan so far is pretty similar to US Japan so far in terms of criminal jurisdiction. So um, the, uh, when the crimes happen during on duty, it, the criminal jurisdiction goes to Japan side while the others go to local uh, jurisdiction. Um, but I'm not sure if they have another secret agreement like Japan and the US did to Djibouti. Japan. It, it might be, but I have no source to verify this. And, and like you said, there are many the other countries having so far, like a NATO agreement, and have another uh, so far to the other countries. So there are many issues like this, and even UN forces have not so far. So if you think about it, it's it's maybe it's a smarter to think that the military deployment is actually connected to securing the jurisdiction in local communities. So probably the fundamental issue is not only the U.S. military, but the military itself and the foreign deployment. Thank you. Uh, the next question is from uh, Michael Gibson. Uh, how much of a role do you think race plays in the differences between the sofas in Japan slash South Korea and uh, those in Europe? Uh, I think we discussed this earlier, no? Kind of, but um, I think the, the question is, is there particularly an uh, unfair um, situation when the SOFA is applied to um, communities in Asia as opposed to in Europe? Mm. I mean, I've been, I've been, I've met people in South Korea or like Germany, and I've hear a lot of about similar issues. And also I did an interview in Puerto Rico and Vieques Island where, which has a huge US military bases and occupied for the decades. And the people are suffering from environmental, environmental pollution and health issue. And uh, their land has been taken for decades and never came back. So the, I would say, I, I haven't been seeing that the same situation Wherever the US military bases are, there are always extraterritorial issues and the people are suffering in the communities. But um, for the details, um, if you would like to know that, that how exactly, so, well, I'm sorry, like there's, there are so many differences, but I would say the Japanese so far 
is one of the lowest position. For example, uh, like I said, we don't have right to access to the military base and we cannot regulate the trainings. So let's say we have the, the local communities, even though they wanted to stop the, the training on that day, let's say there was an, a, like a ceremonies or something, and that they cannot say anything. And the recently, as you know, um, the Okinawa has been experiencing the serious environmental pollution related to water pollution from the U US military base. And then it cannot be regulated because we don't have any control over the military base and the US is granted uh, immunity on environmental issues on the base. So uh, the, what happened is uh, the, uh, the, the P force, if you have heard of it, it's a, it's a chemical that we used in the uh, fire distinguished fire distinguisher uh, has been released to the water and went to the underground and they went to local liver and the sea and they contained the local uh, environment. And then the local communities has been protesting against it and urging the US to take action it, but the situation haven't changed and then we don't know, like same thing might happen in the future, most probably will happen, but there's no regulation to stop this situation and because of so far. So yeah, if you look at the US Japan so far, I would say this is the one of the lowest level of so far within, uh, within the other so far. Thank you. That's very clear. I think we have two more questions. Um... So um, does the US ambassador to Japan have any influence in the decisions? The ambassador, you mean, do you talk about the current ambassador or the, the previous ambassador? I think it does, so I assume it's a current ambassador. The current ambassador? Mm, I mean, the, the decisions on the military policy, you mean? Or like in in, in any... I believe so far related situations that you just presented. I, I, I guess so. I mean, like, I'm sorry, I couldn't give you the clear like example or answer to that. But... Uh, it's very, I, I understand that. Yeah. Uh, we do not quite know, but um, he or she could be. Um, yeah, it could be, yeah, because, because ambassador is a, it, it's a representative, representative of the US, right? So I, the, as, a, as a role, it could give a huge influence on Japanese, but we don't know, you know, like, and then I think that it, it depends on the case as well. And I'm sorry, I don't have any information to answer this question. Um, that's great. Uh, I think I'll read one more long one. Um, if you can see Wesleyan, uh, Nicole, um, can you identify that question? It's a long one towards the end, not the last one. Um, it's long, so I think it's better if you can read it on the text as well. I'm not sure if you are familiar with the UCMJ um, Uniform Code of Military Justice. They are uh, rules that military service members are, are subjected to if they commit a crime. When we enlist, um, we sign our freedoms away, basically, so the military considers us as property. From my understanding, um, we are tried under our US government, and I also agree that I wish there were transparency. I'm not entirely sure, however, I have heard that if we commit a crime off duty in the US, um, we are tried under the UCMJ first, and then after um, they have served in military prison, maybe it is called a brick on a military base. They may be released to the civilian trial and that depending on the <clears throat> severity of the crime, they may also serve prison time of base. Hmm. 
So, um, I see. Yeah, I think this is a this is something like I would love to work on as well, because I believe that the the communities in the U.S. which live with the U.S. military bases may have the same issues that the communities in foreign countries have. And like you said, it's like a, U, a UCMJ, maybe it works as a, as a, you know, another sofa against the local people or like or American people. And then I, I think by researching this issue, I think we can probably find out the fundamental issue of having military bases and living with, live, having the US military bases in the community and how, who is gonna be affected by that? And probably I assume that the women and children will be the first one to be influenced by the deployment. So yeah, I would love to learn about this and I, I'm going to learn more about the USCMJ. So thank you very much for sharing the information. Thank you. Um, I keep receiving new messages and questions, but I think we've been asking you to keep answering all the complicated questions for the past 30 minutes. So I think um, I'll end um, Q&A session here. There are a couple of comments. Um, one says um, from Masayo Shimizu, democracy, it is shocking to learn your report. And uh, another one, thank you. Frankly, this is a human rights tragedy. And I think these comments are um, <clears throat> especially relevant given that um, many of the cases are happening in Okinawa. And uh, um, those who ask questions that we couldn't handle here today, I'll make sure that these questions will be passed to Hanayo. And uh, I learned a lot from your talk and the Q&A session today. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for having me. And thank you very much for everyone for joining, joining me. <laughs>